Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we get to sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players and related music industry experts. If you love playing guitar, stick around. You're in the right place. Hey, this is Craig Garber. When I'm not interviewing world-class guitar players, I'm busy helping clients with their marketing. In fact, since March of 2000, I've helped over 300 clients in 108 different industries all over the world sell everything from $20 books to $5,000 seminar seats and everything in between. I even authored a marketing book called How to Make Maximum Money with Minimum Customers. And now I'm giving away a free marketing strategy session to business owners who qualify. On this call, we'll discuss what's currently working in your business, specific sales and marketing problems you're struggling with, and I'll identify specific strategies you can use to overcome these problems and increase your cash flow. To find out if you qualify and to book your free marketing strategy session with me, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash marketing right now. Again, to book your free marketing strategy session with me, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash marketing right now. Thanks for listening. Now let's get on with the show. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar, and we've got an amazingly uh, cool and uh, incredibly talented guitar player with us. We're with Jane Getter out of New York City. Uh, according to Guitar Player Magazine, Jane's the fiercest female ever to strap on a Stratocaster, but I think even if she played a Telecaster, they'd be saying the same thing. Um, she's an amazing player as well as a band leader and a very gifted writer. Her composing talents received attention when she won the ASCAP Gershwin Award for Music for Theater and Dance in the mid-90s. At the same time, she also recorded and toured with Lenny White, the legendary drummer from Return to Forever. And she co-wrote with Lenny Urbanator's smooth jazz hit Hopscotch, along with some other compositions, which were recorded on Lenny White's Present Tense and Acoustic Masters CD. She also received widespread exposure playing guitar in the Saturday Night Live Band in 1995. She's released five solo albums on her own. Her third album, Three, was submitted for a Grammy nomination, and her latest album, On Tour, features her own band, The Jane Getter Premonition, and it's also been submitted for a Grammy nomination. Um, I will tell you, if you haven't heard this band, you really should listen to them. They're extremely talented, really passionate, and they play great music. Um, and I'd say uh, it's probably a combination of hard rock, fusion, funk, and blues, and they really... I mean, it's not for the faint of heart, man. You better go in there prepared to get some energy uh, boosted into you. Uh, I would recommend you check out her song Train Man on YouTube just as an opener. It will uh, really knock your socks off. Her band's got some extremely talented people. Adam Holtzman on keys. He's played with Miles Davis and Stephen Wilson. Brian Beller on bass. He's played with Joe Satriani and the Aristocats. And the touring bass player is usually Stu Ham or Mark Egan. Uh, Chad Wackerman on drums. Chad's been with Frank Zappa and Alan Holdsworth. And special guests, Corey Glover, who is also a special guest for the recording of the album On, and Vernon Reed, who uh, plays with them on sets sometimes. Alex Skolnick from Testament and the Alex Skolnick Trio is also part of the band. Uh, we inter I interviewed Alex in episode 196, incredibly talented musician. And uh, Theo Travis plays saxophone. He's played with Stephen Wilson and Robert Fripp. He is as well a special guest with the band. Jane's appeared in Guitar Player Magazine regularly with feature interviews in the February 2013 and January 2016 issues. She's also written instructional articles for Guitar Player Session uh, sorry, session section. Other great artists Jane has recorded or performed with including Ursula Dudziak, The Roots, The Jam, Jimo. Uh, I don't always say that name. It's Jamo. How do you, is it Jamo? JMO. JMO. I don't know. I've, I've messed that up for like 40 years. From the Allman <laughs> Brothers, I, I have. Kenny Garrett and legendary Headhunters drummer Mike Clark, Regina Carter, Michael Urbaniak, and many more. Her band has played and toured internationally in festivals and venues worldwide, including Warsaw's Guitar City, Austria's Outreach Festival, San Francisco Jazz Festival, New York City at BB King's, The Blue Note, The Iridium. These are all first class clubs in New York. India's B Flat Bar, the North Sea Jazz Club, and many more. Jane, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the show. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's great to be here. Uh, the Gershwin Award. What was what was that for? And is there a backstory to that? When I was a uh, music student at City College in New York, they presented an opportunity to the uh, students to submit a composition for this this uh, contest that they have. And it was that it was exactly that music for theater or dance, and so I submitted 
I it was a song that I had written and I I turned it into like a suite with with a few different movements. It's called the Red Earth Suite. Unfortunately, it's never been played, but I did write it, and um, and I won it, and I won fifteen hundred bucks. That's a lot of money. Ma- and bought my Mesa Boogie Mark V with it. Very cool. And so you were just a kid when that happened. That's awesome. Very cool. And uh, then you wound up touring with Lenny. Was that through the visibility of getting that award that you hooked up with Lenny White? No, no. No, okay. That was um, with Lenny White with Urbanator. That was with Urbanator. How did you guys get? Con- how did you get connected with him in the first place? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, let's see. I'm trying to remember how I met Lenny. Uh, it was, it was just through some New York connections, and we started writing together. And it was at that time that Michael Urbaniak formed the urbanator band and uh we wrote a few songs obviously one of them ended up being their smooth jazz hit called hopscotch which is still being played um and then there's a few other songs that lenny plays with his current band a lot now that we wrote together talk about maybe if you can uh, how you wound up connecting with these folks and if you have any cool or interesting stories about your experiences with them vernon reed vernon reed i met through uh, my husband Adam Halsman knows him. I'm not sure how he knows him, but I met him through that connection. Obviously, that connection. I met him through my <laughs> husband. <laughs> and um, the my only thing that I, I can say about Vernon Reed is that he's a really nice, down to earth uh, person, and really got has some interesting ideas about life and ways of looking at life. And I enjoyed working with him a lot. From a playing standpoint, what is like, what makes him Vernon Reed? Is there, I mean, it's a kind of a vague question. Let me see if I could rephrase that. He's really got a unique style and vibe. Like when he picks up the guitar, it's like, oh, that's right. Vernon Reed, like immediately. Right, right, right. Why, what, it, what is that? Is it his tone or, I mean, it's a bunch of things, but I, I, I think when he, when he's soloing and he, he gets like, you know, into the, uh, into the, 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 um, what's the word, the climax of his solo, in the middle of his solo, he plays this really fast stuff. It's almost like, um, the notes are almost sort of hard to pick out. It's sort of just sort of a wave of sound, you know, yeah. and I find really interesting. And he, he plays with this huge pick. I mean, it's like huge and and thick and and hard. I mean, it's like I don't know how he how he act, actually manages to manipulate that pick. But, um, <laughs> but. that's interesting because I, I you read articles on some of them. People will say oh, this is the pick you got to use, and it's always like a pick like that. And I I mm-hmm. I've played them, and I'm like, how the hell do you do anything with this thing? Yeah, no, and I play with such the opposite, a really small um, those teardrop picks. Yeah. Then uh, that I even like file down a little bit the edges so that it it fits to how I like it when you yeah. know, custom size so it's such the opposite of that. Yeah, to me, I see those things like using uh, the end of a spoon or something like that. Mm. It's just really awkward and just weird. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, I tell I tell my students that um, when they're holding a pick mm. uh, too far to the end where they've got a lot of pick in front of them that they have to maneuver. It's almost like when you're playing baseball when you were a kid and you pick up a bat that's too big for you hmm. and, and you don't choke up. You've got uh, something that it's, it's just hard to control, you know, and that's why you choke up on a bat. And that's why I tell my students, to, you know, to compare it to that. And you got to, you want, like, you want to have less pick to, to maneuver, you know. Jane, I'm very impressed by your baseball knowledge, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> we, Jane's got it all. Guitar lessons, coaching and baseball. <laughs> Uh, how about how about JMO? JMO was a connection through an agent I was working with at that time, and you know I had been a big uh, Allman Brothers fan for years, and so I was really really excited. And he's got he's a jazz player at heart. I mean that's what he loves to play jazz, and he's got a jazz uh, band right now that's that's been touring and doing shows, but. Um, it's so funny when even when you play jazz with him, you, it still sounds like the Almond Brothers. It's so weird. <laughs> I'm not really sure what it is that he's doing, but his sound 
said is like <laughs> that's really I, funny i was cracking up and we were playing it's like holy shit playing with the allman brothers <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> what's he like as a leader a band leader um let's see what is he like and, and i'm not looking for gossip i mean like yeah uh, um philosophy or management or or you know what well, kind, he, of, what kind of vibe cult- he was co-leading with this uh, trombone player named Dick Griffin. So it wasn't all on him, but, but he, you know, he focuses on, um, on the rhythm part of what you're doing Mm -hmm. and not so much, uh, harmonically or the notes or whatever. I mean, for him, it's got to feel good and, um, it's got to be, you know, in the pocket and that's the kind of stuff that he would focus on. So dr- it, it, my drummer mindset, drummer approach, I guess, is, is mm-hmm. yeah. what, what you'd expect. Yeah, cool. Yeah. What are you working on now that you're most excited about? You got a lot of things, you know, fingers in a lot of things. Yeah, I'm um, I'm working on my next album. Well, uh, writing the material for my next album, and um, I'm you know pretty psyched about about what's coming out uh, compositionally, and I actually have more than enough material for another album so i don't know if you know if possible to do a two two cd set or depending on what you know what i can come up with financially for it but sure yeah mm-hmm. is this going to be with the your, the jane getter premonition yeah mm-hmm. do any of the do you do all the writing alone or you do co-writing with these guys oh uh, i'm the sole writer for the stuff wow mm-hmm. that's a lot of work yeah. To crank out all that material. That's tough. Yeah. Uh, where are you originally from? And where'd you grow up? New, New Jersey. And you grew up in Jersey? Yep. What was your childhood like growing up there? Very suburban. Uh, my dad, you know, worked. He was a general contractor. Worked six days a week, actually, usually. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. And, uh, I mean, that's basically it. I mean, I, I got... You know, they gave us, me and my sister, music lessons when we were young. And she didn't stay with music, I did. And very supportive of the, very supportive of the arts, even though they're not artists themselves. You know, uh, My mom always said, my, my mom always was hoping that I would marry a doctor or a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Very conventional. And I, could, uh, I, could do my, I could do my music. You then know? you could do your music, yeah. Yeah, right, right, right. right. You know, it's interesting, though. That but didn't happen. But like probably 75 to 80% of the musicians I interview had super supportive parents. Mm, mm-hmm. And I, I don't think that's by coincidence. I think that that's a big it's tough enough being a musician you know but to to do it in the face of like don't do that you know blah 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 mm-hmm, i think it's mm-hmm. like but like 75 to 80 maybe even more it's it's a mm-hmm. very high number uh, mm-hmm. very consistently mm-hmm. yeah interesting mm-hmm. was so playing guitar was something you always wanted to do or you yeah uh, going back to the music lessons that i was given as a child I was given piano lessons. This is a fun story that I like to tell. I was given piano lessons and my sister was given guitar lessons. And during her lessons, I used to sit at the top of the stairs and spy on her lessons. And so I think I was always drawn to the guitar, even at an early age. I was like nine or 10 or something like that. So yeah, I was always, always drawn to the guitar. Very cool. Now your style of playing you're like very talented and you incorporate lots of genres of music, right? And it's all played, <clears throat> excuse me, at a very high and intense level, you know, of performance and, and you Thank know, you. energy, intensity. Thank um, you. You're welcome. Um, I was curious what attracted you to that and did you always play like that or was this something you like found a voice and you grew into it or? Well, I think that uh, I went through different stages of, uh, musical styles, never discounting any other styles. I, I I love many many different styles of music. I have a very eclectic taste in music, and even if I was playing, uh, even in, during my jazz years, I was always listening to rock and you know, uh, world music and all different kinds of music. And 
so I think that that just all, you know, all ended up, you know, coming out to what I'm doing now. I mean, even throughout all my time when I, when I write in my different stages of, of uh, musical endeavor, I think that it always, all my eclectic tastes in music always enters into it and comes out in my writing, has always come out of my writing. One thing I, w- I was curious about also, um, you play at a very intense level. Good. And and I you mean that in a very good way, like emotionally and it's like you're bringing it, you know, you could tell mm, mm-hmm. and you could feel it. Mm. When people do that, I find that a lot of times there's like working, you know, it's like you're working something out almost in your brain. Like, you know, that's a, an outlet for you to dump, mm. you know, whatever mm-hmm. stress, emotional garbage or, you know, bullshit's going on in, in your head. Is there something like specific that has, that drew you to that? You know, like, did you feel like when you first got that intensity, uh, you were able to, you know, clean out your head of, of X, Y, and Z specific stuff or that, you know, like what motivates, what's the emotional motivator for you to play at that level? If, if that's even a question. Experiencing many times when I've experienced, um, like breakups with boyfriends or, um, rejections from, from certain gigs I didn't get or certain situations or I don't know, uh, like the death of my father or something, I I end up writing songs that helps that that connects with with what I'm going through and it help it channels that that emotion of that experience and then the it, for some reason it it kind of helps me uh, deal with the situation. Yeah, and, well, but it's not a conscious thing. Like I just pick up the guitar and I just start. You know, I just start coming up with some stuff and it just really gets, you know, connects to the experience. It mm-hmm. comes out of the experience. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not surprised though, because you, like I said, you, you, you're bringing it and, you know, as a listener, you feel that stuff, you know, mm-hmm. you can mm-hmm. tell when someone's like, you know, don't interrupt this one, you know, <laughs> <laughs> kind of a thing because it's like, whoa, which is great. You know, it's like, you know, a privilege to see that. Yeah. Because I feel you're, I'm sorry, uh, like to some extent that person's making themselves vulnerable there. You yeah. Know? And so I respect that yeah. very much. Yeah. In terms of the playing, the intensity in the playing, to me, like um, one of the most amazing experiences when you're playing is when you're totally connected. I, I, I call it connected to the universe, really. Hmm. And, you, and the band and and you know the you're playing and and everybody's connected and there's no no bullshit yeah from you know your life or the world or politics or anything else that kind of brings you down it's gone and you are just totally connected with it and it's expression of of your soul huh. you know I feel you also do a good job in your writing um and that sounds mean because, like, you do a good job. Like, who the hell am I? Um, I really enjoy is probably a better way of saying it. You mm-hmm. mod, your modulation is really deliberate and very smart. From a you know, it, you, it's planned and it's done really, really well. Do you do that intentionally, or is like as you're writing, or is that coming out in the music? Modulation, you're, you're talking like, about volume. You no know, volume oh. and um, tempo sort of stuff. Mm. Well, sometimes it's conscious. Like sometimes I, you know, if there's like a really heavy section and then I, I, I feel that it needs to, there needs to be a break from that. Uh, just because it gets after, if, you're, if you've got like a really intense, tense section for a long period of time, it just starts sounding less intense and, and uh, the listening experience becomes numbed out. Yeah. You do a great job of making sure that oh, doesn't happen. You. That's, like you, oh, you mentioned, you. what made me think of it is you said before about Vernon when he gets to the climax of the solo. It's a way, mm-hmm. a way. Your music is like that. Mm. You do a good mm-hmm. job climaxing it, backing it down, and it's mm. it's. Mm-hmm. The, oh, thank you. The climax you. is a, it's you know very powerful. It's it's. Well, thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, mm-hmm. um, you've been doing this a long time. 
what are some of the obstacles that you've had to overcome or challenges throughout your career, either personally music related or business related? Yeah. Well, when things have throughout my career, you know, I go through like slow periods and busy periods and when the slow periods, meaning when there's not much going on and, you know, I, then I start doubting, uh, my, I have started doubting myself. Am I doing, am I kidding myself? Is this, you know what I mean? It's like, if this is, is, is this what I should be doing? Should I forget about it? And should, you know, should I get a job? You know, so I've had to go through that. Um, I mean, I went through that a lot in my earlier stages of the career. And, you know, I, I've, I've reached a certain level where, Every once in a while, I get a glimpse of self doubt, but um, I still, I mean, I feel pretty confident that what I'm doing is what I'm, I should be doing. Yeah. You know? No, I totally get that. Um, so, that is something that I ha- I've had to deal with throughout my career. Uh, uh, thankfully, not so much anymore. <laughs> the, other, the other obstacle that I've encountered is, has been the, uh, the woman playing playing uh you know electric guitar in a man's world and the opportunities that i feel that i was denied because of my because of my sex and i mean i don't know if if how many of the gigs that i've always that i've wanted or that i didn't get had to do with my sex or my playing or whatever but i do know that there are certain band leaders that just don't want a woman in their band. Sure. And uh, if if someone is looking for a guitar player and they've got a list of five players and there's a woman in there, she's going to get called last. Right. Because the, the reputation of women players is not as, you know, as a whole, is not as on the same level as, as male players. So I feel like I've missed out on some opportunities there. It's interesting because I've heard that a couple of times and and the women I've heard it from have all been like such amazing players. Mm, I'm like, mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, that like I just it's very hard to imagine that somebody wouldn't like want a player of that caliber. Yeah, it yeah. just seems really weird. Like, you know, if a person who wasn't a good player mentioned that man or woman, you could be like, mm-hmm. well, OK, you know, you just shut up but that's really amazing is that does that happen less and less now over time uh i don't know i mean i i hope it does i Uh hope you know and but i don't know um i can't really answer that Uh i mean because there are there are in you know out 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 there in the world there's a lot of great women players a lot more than from when i first started Mm. you know in in this endeavor so hopefully the world is uh, more accepting of that. Yeah. Uh, so I, I would hope so. Um, if you had to go back and give younger Jane advice, mm-hmm. assuming you mm-hmm. would have listened to yourself, what advice mm-hmm. might you have given yourself to make life easier? Financial planning. Learn, um, learn I just, the money. I just opened up an IRA a few years ago and I, <sighs> You know, as a as an artist, it's really hard to save money sure. and to put money away. And but I could have managed if I had realized the importance of it. So I would recommend that to all you know young musicians and don't don't forget about that. There is going to come a day where you're going to need need some retirement money. Yeah. And, um, it's not something to think, oh, I'll just do it sometime in the future because all of a sudden it's the future. Yeah. It's hard to <laughs> tell people that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Time goes. I know. Um, let's talk about gear for a few minutes. Mm-hmm. What's your go-to guitar right now and maybe what other few guitars would round out your top? Yeah. Uh, my main guitar right now is a Picamoose Model 1. Uh, Picamoose is a small guitar shop in New York City owned and run by Paul Schwartz who makes all the guitars and it's a it's a Strat style with humbuckers I met Paul when I was a Fender artist 
because he was the authorized Fender repair person, and I was bringing my Strat and my Tele and you know some other other guitars for him to to work on, and he, you know, obviously knew how I like guitars set up and blah blah blah, and then he just surprised me one day with this beautiful uh, Pico Moose guitar. It's this like orangey red with the sunburst it's a beautiful color yeah the you color is on awesome my yeah the color is beautiful yeah it's got a red neck and i always say this is the only red neck i like yeah <laughs> how do you spell pika moose p-e-e-k-a-m-o-o-s-e what a wild name yeah a pika moose okay is he where is he's located in the city yep mm-hmm. is, he, is he uptown by any chance now he's uptown on the Upper East Side. He used to be in um, 351 West 30th Street, the, <laughs> the music, music and arts building where there was a lot of rehearsal studios. And, and I, I'm not sure. He might have been the only guitar shop. Uh, but it was a big, yeah, there was a lot of rehearsal studios. And then some developer bought it and kicked everybody out. So mm. he moved up to the Upper East Side. Yeah, because yeah, somebody had mentioned, another player in the city had mentioned him to me, I, I'm pretty oh. sure, that he... They did his work, his setups, his oh, luth- you know, his uh-huh. luthier, basically. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So I've heard that name before. Mm-hmm. Cool. So that you do you use that pretty much all the time? I yeah, that's my main guitar. Yep. I mean, I have um, I have a, a Strat, a, a '60s style reissue from the custom shop that uh, I used a lot before this one. I also have a '71 Tele that I love, but I find this one is. Uh, more versatile and i think it has a great sound and just feels fantastic does he uh are those his pickups in there are they there's seymour duncan okay great Mm -hmm. yeah your guitar is beautiful that's the first thing i noticed and i I noticed that neck too i said wow what the hell is it that's not (laughs) i said god that must be like a custom shop or something like that interesting Yeah. yeah um amp wise what do you play out of usually now I'm playing a Fuchs Full House 50. Are you familiar have, with Fuchs no, I have Audio not. Technology? I was going to ask another, you, what is that? Another small boutique shop out of Clifton, New Jersey. And um, it's it's got a great... Well, I have a... It's a head and a 212 cabinet. And it's, it's got... It just sounds great. And I was playing a, a Mesa Boogie Mark V for a long time. And it just was so heavy. I mean, it's just really hard to to uh to move around for gigs and i played through one of these was like wow this is so great and so i sold the the boogie and got this you like support the tri-state uh, i do yeah they're very I do. The do, boutique shop yeah sure. do you know what i remember about clifton new jersey do you remember when we were kids there was a commercial on television to send film to get developed and it was this place in Clifton, New Jersey. It was like a revolutionary thing. Like, you know, instead of bringing your pictures down to the local developer, you'd send it and they give you like three times as many pictures for half the price. It was like a mail order. Yeah, that's only I remember. Wow, I don't remember that. Clifton, New Jersey. I have a lot <laughs> of useless things in my head, Jane. Um, <laughs> uh, if I, musically, well, let me ask you this. How, what fuels your obsession to play? Like, how do you feel? Like, and you, I know you said when you're, you know, at one with the universe. You've been doing this a long time. You've made a lot of sacrifices, you know, financially, emotionally, time, and you're still super passionate about it. What is that thing? Yeah, I feel that, well, as a musician, I'm, I'm just constantly evolving. I mean, I hope that I'm evolving and growing. And so, and when, as that happens, there's a, uh, you know, new things that I bring into my playing that makes it um, still exciting and fresh for me. So it's a, it's a it's an ongoing mechanism for your own personal development and musical development. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And that yes. gets you excited. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's an that's a an inch, that's a great answer because yeah. I think that's what I think. I think ultimately that's why everybody does whatever it is they're doing. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, because when not when when you're not constantly growing and and uh, being interested or excited about new things, it becomes stagnant and yeah. boring. Like, what's the point? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very cool. Thank I've you. been there, done it. So, yeah. <laughs> um, 
musically, if I asked you to pick your top three Desert Island discs. I mm. hate this question. <laughs> I know. Sorry. It's so hard. It is hard. But I but actually, I, I, go ahead. I actually do have, um, I've been thinking about that lately. And I do have an answer for you. Great. It's just for today. And in no, you know, you can right, change it right. tomorrow. It's just, you know, like, well, knee one of them is always going to be Stevie Wonder's Songs in the Key of Life. Great. Um, and Mahavishnu Orchestra, Inner Mounting Flame. See, that's a highly evolved musician picking that. Yeah. yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. I could tell you right yeah. now. So those two were easy. It's the third one that <laughs> is hard to limit. But I'd have to say right now is Nine Inch Nails with Teeth. That's very cool. All right. Now, the good thing is you could change your answer now because it was just like knee-jerk reaction. So <laughs> Pass. It's over. Um, okay. What have you learned about yourself throughout this journey you've been on? That when I have – when I have – I stay true to my convictions. Like I haven't during those periods where I've been tempted to just quit and just do something else. If things weren't going the way I wanted, or if I was broke and blah blah blah, I still m managed to just stay with it. And so I guess I'm I'm pretty proud of myself that way. Yeah, you should be. You know, it's funny when you talk with someone from New York, like. We're usually like at 45 minutes with a non-New Yorker at this point in time in the interview. You're like, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> <laughs> what, something or someone you miss for your, from your childhood? I have to say my father. I mean, he, he died in 2001. But he definitely played a big part of my, um, you know, growing up as a, as a person, as an artist. And, you know. Probably got a lot of your work ethic from him. Got a lot of my work ethic from mm -hmm. him. Yeah, mm -hmm. I did. Yeah, he was a really hard worker. Like I said, he worked six days a week, and you know, like left at like five in the morning, and we get home at like seven at night. And he he was very honest and had a lot of integrity and really sincere and smart. Mm -hmm. And even though he wasn't an artist, he would always have good advice and that that would fit into any situation and i always trusted him and you know intensely i wrote a song for him uh when he died called did i ever tell you it's on my album c jane run if anybody's interested in checking it out wow that's pretty intense what was the name of it did i ever tell you and it's on c jane run what a great album title Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. You get it. That's great. That is amazing. Yeah. A lot of the young, younger people, the millennials, won't get it because they didn't have to go through that. Wow. What a great album title. <laughs> C. J. Run. That's fantastic. Very cool song name, too. Oh, thanks. Um, what do you do when you're having a bad day to make yourself feel better? Depends on what... what has caused it to be a bad day the source of the stress right <laughs> the source of the stress like i said earlier if it's um well obviously i haven't had to deal with breaking up with a boyfriend for a long time because i've been married for a long time how long have you been married 26 years holy shit congratulations thanks that's yeah. pretty impressive yeah, yeah that's awesome jane yeah yeah that's a lot of work people don't realize that yeah good for you thanks uh, so, and, you know, if there's been a, another, like, you know, if I didn't get a gig that I wanted or that, and then I started feeling, you know, insecure, you know, or whatever, um, I would end up writing a song <laughs> like I talked about earlier. But other than that, I would go have a glass of wine or, um, watch a movie to take my mind off it. Or maybe the combination of all of that. <laughs> yeah, I'll say alcohol always fixes everything. It's so good. <laughs> Do you have any uh, non-musical superpowers? What do you mean by superpower? 
you know, superpowers, like something that's inherent to you that like is a, you know, besides music, like obviously music for you is a superpower. You have this gift Mm -hmm. and other people Mm -hmm. have like things that are like they're really good at, you know, that just come Uh naturally to them, like maybe sports or, you know, some people's like cooking or, Mm -hmm. you know, extra sensory perception. I um, I take dance. Really? Yeah. African dance. I do a style of African dance from Senegal called Sabar. Wow, that is wild. Yeah. And when does the baseball stuff come in? Oh. <laughs> that was really impressive. You're like, you know, yeah, you know, that's a, you're the first woman to give me a baseball analogy about choking yeah. up. I was like, wow, that where the, where did uh, you get all that from? Well, I was I was a pretty good athlete in my younger days, okay. I guess, uh growing up and um I guess, I, you know, I mean, I don't do much sports now. I mean, I do ski or, you know, play tennis, but mm-hmm. not not consistently. And I was I was a big Mets fan for a while. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't been following baseball that much. But I guess that's it. I was a pretty good athlete, and, you know, like when I was in high school and stuff. Very cool. Um, is there anything you're still interested in learning how to do? Yes. I would love to learn to speak other languages. And I know a little bit of French. Uh, my dream is to become fluent in French. And at at certain points, I attempt to get that going, but then I always end up stopping it. So maybe maybe I just have to live in France for a little I, while. I was just going to say, yeah, that's the mm-hmm. ticket there. I mean, it's hard to mm-hmm. l- you know learn another language on your own, I would think, because yeah. like, who do you talk to? You look in the mirror, you talk back to the tape recorder. It's not like... Right, right, right. It's right. kind of tough. Yeah, um, I always admire people that speak more than one language. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty cool. Mm. Um, anything, if you can go back in time and do anything differently, either business or personal, besides financial planning, anything else that you would do? Possibly um, start trying to get pregnant earlier than when I did. How, I have one one amazing son, and I did try to, to have another child after that, but it didn't happen. So possibly start that whole thing earlier. But I had my career and everything, and I, I just wasn't ready. So I, I, um, That's really – how old is your son? He's 24. Man, I give you a lot of credit juggling raising a child and and your career. That's a lot. That's like two full-time jobs. And maybe yeah. three because being a musician is not you know, it's a lot of stuff that you're doing all the time. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. Good for you. Congratulations. Thank you. Wow, you're a uh, just like impressing the shit out of everybody I think here, Dame. <laughs> so you know, I mean, that's really impressive. 26 years of marriage and that's great. And mm, raising thanks. a kid, being a full-time mom, full-time yeah. musician. Good for you. Thank um, you. Two more questions. Uh, mm-hmm. wh- what are you looking forward to in the future, either musically, professionally, or personally? So musically, I'm looking forward to my next album, getting that up and running, and then hopefully, um, you know, getting getting that out, getting my band out touring again. And I would love to go back to Europe with my band. Um, and then personally, I'm, my husband and I are planning a vacation in the Greek islands. So I'm really looking forward to that. That's great. And last question, and I really appreciate, uh, sharing your story. What's been the biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years and how much of this change has been deliberate and intentional on your part and how much has just been a natural part of aging? I... Recently, uh, last year or two years, I broke, I tripped in the, in the sidewalks in New York and um, broke two fingers. Oh, crap. Yeah. And they were my pinky finger, my ring finger on my right hand. So, okay. I mean, if, if I had to if, break yeah. fingers, those would be the ones. Holy crap. Yeah. So that was really horrible. So ever since then, I've been really cautious, like when I'm walking around and um, in any situations that I even get fearful like when i get on a ride to ride a bike like the first time i get on a bike after not riding i'm afraid i'm gonna fall sure and i never had that you know and um or climbing up on something or something like that i just have much i have more fear and i'm much more cautious yeah some i think that's a lot of that's age related too because i think yeah. people in general just become more aware of 
stuff like that, you know. So, yeah, stuff that could happen to you. Yeah, yeah. Not as aggressive when you're making a turn in the left or something like that. You wait till all the cars come instead right, of just, right. you know, powering through it. Or and even skiing, um, you know, I don't, I don't go for like the hardest slopes anymore, you know, because it's just, I mean, yeah, I yeah. just don't do that anymore. No, I to- totally get that. Mm. Well, hey, listen, um. I can't thank you enough for your time. Let me tell people uh, where they could find you online and um, please fill in the gaps if I miss anything. Mm. So first of all, it's Jane Getter, G E T T E R. Um, she's a phenomenal guitar player and um, just very intense, uh, r- great music that she's putting out. Um, you have a show coming up on June 3rd at Garcia's in Port Chester, mm. correct? Yep. Port Chester, New York. Yep. G- great. Okay. It's part of the Capitol theater. Great. So if you're in the area, please go support Jane there. Uh, her new album or her latest album, On, is available. It's You can get it at janegetter.com. It's also on Amazon. For those of you over in Europe, it's on Burning Shed. Um, I think... That, what's that? Yeah, please. It's actually, the latest album is the live version of that on tour, but on, that's the latest studio album. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you do lessons periodically. Yep. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I teach teach a bunch. Yep. So online Skype lessons and in-person lessons at her home studio. You can get a hold of Jane through the contact form um, on her webpage at janegetter.com. Let me ask you this. Um, I know you said you're, you're looking at getting your album from the next album recorded. From time to time, you know, people ask me about participating and, you know, people are curious, like things like funding or becoming executive producers uh, for some of the people that are on the show, is there opportunities like that with you? Well, actually, yes. Um, we are in the process of looking for the right person to uh, become an executive producer for the next album. And uh, it's got to be, obviously, the, the right person, a big music fan and you know, uh, supportive of the project and everything. But uh, that is definitely something that we are doing. And... Um, yeah. So if someone, any of you guys listen to that, if you're interested in becoming an executive producer and working with an artist, um, obviously check Jane's music out and make sure, make sure it's your cup of tea. Um, if you like great guitar playing, then it's probably going to be a fit. But uh, how would they contact you? Like, Can they go to the contact form on your website? Yeah, just go right to my website, janegetter.com, great. and there's a contact form there. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Hey, any final words of wisdom? Final words of wisdom. Uh, just, <laughs> just keep shedding. Keep just shedding. Keep shedding. <laughs> hey, listen, thank you for everything. I really appreciate your time. Everybody, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did. Thanks again to Jane Getter for spending time with us. Please check her out and support her online at janegetter.com and uh, all her other projects. Um, go to everyonelovesguitar.com sign up to get on our newsletter list to get notified of future episodes along with some early product announcements and remember happiness is a choice so choose wisely be nice go play your guitar and have some fun till next time peace and love everybody I'm out we hope you enjoyed this show if you did subscribe to the everyone loves guitar podcast and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes and if you like the show please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music.